So this session is entitled Beyond the Platform. I'm Sean Walker, who I'm sure almost everybody knows, and unless you're totally new to the community or suffer from dementia, Sean is the CTO of DNN Corp and also a co-founder of the company. And I'm Bob Kruger, I'm the head of engineering at DNN Corp. And what we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk, of course, about the platform, but when we proposed the session, we thought that people might be interested to hear a little bit more. I know that a lot of the people here really are just interested in the community, but at the same time, what we do on the commercial side impacts the community, and we all benefit from that. We want to show you what we're doing so you understand that as well. We also thought it would help to understand why we do some of the things that we do. I know that comes up quite often in conversations and over email, so we'll have the opportunity to hear about some of that today too. To begin with, this is some of the motivation for where we're at today. When you look at where we've been, you know, the, the simplicity of creating a website, having that search by Google, being able to find results, you know, that's, that's days past. That's long gone. If you talk to people today in marketing organizations, you hear about how much complexity is really out there, what it takes for them to produce something that is noticed by people that attracts more customers to their site, that gets people to purchase. It's no longer just a simple task. There are a lot of different uh, media and networks that are leveraged in order to do that. At the same time, there's a transition that's occurring. Instead of having some geek downstairs in the basement who runs a website, the owner quite often now is a marketing person. And the responsibilities now fall under the guise of marketing. If you even look at DNN, what we've been doing over the course of the past several months is in fact transitioning where the resource that constructs a lot of what goes on on the website is done in engineering, but the responsibility for making an engaging site actually rests with marketing. And the budget comes from marketing as opposed to from engineering. So why is this the case? What really does this mean? How does that play into our vision going forward? Well, thinking about this from a marketing standpoint, people have been doing things for a long time in terms of creating programs. That's been traditionally when you talk to a marketing person, you would ask them what sort of program are you working on. They could tell you an event of some sort, a seminar, you know, conference, and it was very easy to measure results. In fact, that stuff was instrumented like crazy so that they could understand the value of doing those particular activities. But today, it's a different world. People react to things very differently, and the way they communicate is through content. And they have content that's communicated not just from a website, but through various social networks, through other forms of services, and all this needs to be pulled together. And this is kind of what we're heading towards in terms of a focus from DNN itself. The idea is building around the notion of content and how we help marketing organizations be much more effective with content. It's continuing to build off of what we've been doing traditionally in terms of websites, things like that, content marketing in that fashion, but moving then to the advantages that social networks have in terms of engaging people and having them help you sell your products. So when we move forward then, even further, we look at the notion of content itself and how to make that still more valuable. Think about it this way. A lot of companies, particularly IT organizations, have focused on cost savings. They've leveraged technology to save money. But the real focus of attention is on how to make a company more money. If you're going to spend a dollar, how do you get hundreds back or more? It's not just how much you can save. The same thing happens with content. Think about it, there's all this stuff that's published. How do you know if it's effective? Is it getting around to the audience that you intend? Well, that's important and that's what we want to measure. And why this is important to us at DNN Corp is because when we look at the marketplace, when we look at the people out there where the attention is going, we can see that one of the hugest opportunities is really focusing on the marketing organization. If you look at other parts of a company, if you think of the manufacturing area, sales, and finance, those areas are very mature. 
the growth is much slower, but marketing as a functional area has enormous possibilities. And we're at a really great position to capitalize on that. And when I say we, it's not just DNN Corp, it's all of us here have the opportunity to capitalize on that. And it's the experts telling us what this potential is. It's not just us and our own research, although we have done quite a bit of research, we've talked to a lot of chief marketing officers to understand this. So what we're doing is putting this together in the form of a comprehensive marketing, content marketing suite. We're building off of a common platform so that we can leverage these capabilities and provide much greater value to the marketing persona. Thanks, Bob. I'm sitting because I'm going to do a little bit of a demo of, of DNN 7.3 in a few minutes, but we thought it was important to kick this off by giving some longer-term view into where we're going as a company and obviously how we're leveraging the platform on that journey. And we're hoping that the messages that we're sharing are things that resonate with you as well, problems that you're facing as well in your businesses or with the clients that you're servicing. Um, we think that these are pretty common problems and we want to build tools that obviously help you succeed and in turn we will succeed as well. Um, one of the underlying fundamentals of DNN has always been the community. And it still is obviously today. We have a very strong community, both open source and people who are just users of the product, who provide us a great deal of feedback and value. And so there's a lot of different objectives that we have as a company on how we're going to cultivate community. So uh, as far as 2014, uh, we had planning exercises uh, at the end of last year to define what our goals were for 2014 when it comes to community. So one of, the, uh, one of our objectives was to increase engagement uh, with the community over what we had been doing previously. And this was not just increasing engagement with community members, but also encouraging our employees, so DNN Corp employees, to get more involved with the community and contribute more content, contribute more value to the channels that community members are involved with. Um, also, we want to increase the adoption of the DNN platform. So we want to increase the number of downloads, the number of installations that are happening. Because we know that if we can increase the awareness and increase the usability and, and the usefulness of the, of the software, that has larger effects. It has ripple effects for everyone in this room in terms of creating additional opportunities. Um, some of the things that we're tracking um, that are important to understand whether we're successful or, or not at these endeavors are tracking the number of pull requests. So the number of people who are contributing um, contributions back to the platform is important to us. And that's why the, the workshop that was done this morning is in incredibly important for us um, because we want to continue to engage with developers. Um, the number of Forge project releases is also important to us because that is the lifeblood of DNN is all of the rich extensions that exist and, and some of the, the new capabilities that become available on the web and productizing those in such a way that uh, non-technical folks can use them is all about our extensions model. And then further understanding the, uh, the customer understanding of DNN. So through our website we want to provide a good community experience and we want to provide a lot of information avail constantly available, um, either through ourselves or by having other members of our community provide information, uh, and then providing a lot of materials that are available for download. So some of the strategies that we're employing this year to satisfy those, some of those objectives that I just shared, are so we want to continue to focus on the open source development model and solicit more contributions. Uh, the embrace of Git and GitHub has really opened up new opportunities for us that we didn't have previously in terms of allowing us to integrate um, value from the community in a much simpler way than we ever have before. And so we're hoping to stimulate more uh, contributions through that methodology. Um, we also measure all of the different activities that people do uh, in the community, primarily those activities that are done on dnnsoftware.com are things that we track behind the scenes, so the number of forum posts, the number of blogs, the number of comments, all of these things we keep track of and so we can fairly easily assess whether or not certain areas of the community are being underserved or whether there's a lot of healthy growth in certain areas, so we keep track of all those things and then also using gamification to display that information in such a way that those people who are providing the most value get some recognition for their efforts. Um, 
Also, in recognizing our employees on a constant basis, so keeping track of the, the contributions that are made by DNN Corp employees within our community channels and recognizing those folks internally as champions uh, and, and rewarding them. So those are some of the things we're working on. Sponsoring and participating in community events such as DNN Connect, um, and there will be more announcements about a, another event later this year which will be announced tomorrow. Um, more frequent communications. So last year, um, sorry, ashamed to say that there was a lot less communication from DNN Corp. Our community newsletters, which had been a staple of the community for many years, um, became much more sporadic. Um, we've kind of got on a much more regular cadence since November, where we've been sending it out every month. And there's a lot of useful community information that's always in that newsletter, which highlights some of the more hot topics that are being discussed, also highlights a lot of the contributors, many of whom are in this room and contribute constantly on a regular basis by providing great answers and great value to the community. We're also looking to add some additional programs that we don't have today. Uh, so we have an official partner program for those folks who are interested in selling licenses for our commercial products. But there's a lot of folks that are out there that maybe would only be able to sell one or two licenses a year or are focusing exclusively on the platform. And we think that that's totally fine. But what we don't have today is a way to recognize those companies that are focusing on those areas. And so we're going to be providing a directory on dnnsoftware.com for smaller partners that are doing a lot of projects based on the platform. Uh, and the ranking of those companies are going to be based on your community contributions. So the, whole, the idea behind this is a company has X number of employees. All of the contributions of the employees within a company will roll up into a sum total number, which represents the contributions for that company within the ecosystem. And then that company will be ranked accordingly within the directory. So this is all about encouraging companies and individuals to, to contribute to the community in terms of content terms of great answers and feedback. Um, we've already rolled out some improvements to the Forge, which were a long time coming. Um, when we did our site overhaul in the middle of last year, uh, we tried cosmetically to make the site all look very consistent, but in the process we reduced some of the functionality that had been there previously. And in the meantime, some types of, uh, or some areas of the market had shifted. Developers are much more interested now in services like GitHub, and we didn't have any support for that within our Forge. And so recently we did a bunch of changes to the Forge so that we can more easily embrace GitHub. So developers who want to host their projects on GitHub can do so now. Uh, and there's actually some more changes that are going to be coming within the com next few weeks um, to even improve on what we have there right now. User groups have also been an underserved area within the community. Um, we don't have, we, we actually, we have a user group area on dnnsoftware.com today, um, but it's very limited in its um, capabilities. And really what we want to be is the facilitator of relationships within the DNN ecosystem. So most folks today who want to get involved with DNN do come to our website at least at some point to download the platform. Hopefully they come back on a regular basis to download the platform and to get involved in community channels. But based on that, we do have an engagement factor or an, we, at a certain level of engagement with those people. And what we don't do very well today is surface the fact that there are these user groups in their areas and there's like-minded people who are trying to do DNN projects and so what we want to do is be like the LinkedIn of the DNN community and actually proactively facilitate relationships between people so that they can find user groups in their area, they can meet up with people and we can start cult cultivating more of a, a sense of community regionally as well. Um, we want to overhaul the community showcase which is Again, it's another area of the community part of our site which um, is quite outdated now. Most of the examples that we have in our community showcase are representing sites that were built, unfortunately, three or four years ago. So we want to bring that up to date with some more recent examples because we know there are some amazing things that the members of our community are doing with the DNN platform today and why not sh like show them off uh, and in the process also give those folks recognition for their efforts. Um, language packs is another important area, especially important here in Europe where there are so many different cultures um, that need to be able to interact with the software. 
Um, and so we have been providing sort of five official languages. Um, so we pay to have translations done for five official languages. Today we ship those with the platform and with the commercial products. But we also know that there's other members of our community who are creating language packs for the languages that, that we don't have officially provided to us. And so we want to provide a place to, so that people can get access to those more easily. These are things that, again, we had in the past uh, and in the transition to the new website. Um, we've, we didn't actually have the ability to, to um, expose those, and so these are areas that we know we need to serve better. So since Sean mentioned the website, I thought we'd put this right out there because we know that also a lot of community people have had issues with it. And to be really candid, last July when we did this, we had reasons for wanting to change the company name and evolve the brand, and we made the website too much about the brand rather than about the products themselves, and more importantly, about solutions. And I'm not talking about Evoke solutions, but the solutions that customers want to deploy. And so we have since been reworking the website. We also have put more adequate engineering resources on it so that we can focus much more on the solutions themselves, companies using the products, um, creating much more enthusiasm for people who visit the website. When they do that, then, they're more willing to go to the area where the community is located and see all the various resources that are available there. And again, as Sean had mentioned, that was an area that we were deficient after doing the revamp as well. But since then, we've been working to really correct that. Eric has helped substantially in terms of the new website. Nathan uh, Rover is driving it now. We have another full-time engineer, Saren, who is on it. And that's making a huge difference, and we're starting to pick up the pace in terms of changes that were beneficial for the website. So now let's turn attention, if we will, to the portfolio itself and start diving into the platform and the other solutions. We'll talk a little bit about cloud and beyond. And so this is the portfolio as it looks today. It's based on the DNN platform that we all know and love. We're continuing to evolve that. We'll go into some of the details on that, and then we'll get into the solutions themselves. Yeah, and I guess just one point to make on that previous slide is everything that DNN Corp does today is 100% dependent on the platform. Um, and so when we add, want to add new capabilities to our commercial solutions, very often it means that we have to make enhancements to the underlying platform in order to deliver those improvements in the solutions. So we are constantly focusing efforts on the platform as a company. And so, and going forward, that will continue to be the plan. There is no plan to build a standalone product on anything but the platform going forward, which means that our, futures are, our future is directly tied to the platform. And I, I think it's just important to put that out there because I think there is some misconceptions that DNN Corp is perhaps going off in different directions that isn't aligned with the DNN platform, and that is absolutely not the case. Um, we are 100% dependent upon the platform and will continue to be for years to come. So in terms of themes, uh, if we think about sort of very, very high-level themes for roadmap for 2014, um, at the beginning of this year, we looked at some of the areas that we thought we needed to improve in our product suite. And one of the areas was around performance and scalability. Um, so we had heard from customers and from users that there were areas of our products which could use some, some enhancement. In fact, we were feeling some of the pain ourselves on web properties that we own um, in terms of performance and scalability. So this was an area we wanted to focus on quite heavily. Usability has been a constant focus for us for three or four years now, and if you've been around for that length of time and as you've seen new releases come out, you've seen the usability and the user experience of the product change dramatically over that time frame. We've, set, we've kept some sort of key concepts, some of which uh, Daniel was, count, or was uh, talking about in the previous session here about um, you know, sort of inline, um, in context type of, uh, of a focus for, for user experience. Um, but in general, we're trying to keep up with modern web techniques, and we're using a lot more client-side techniques, but there's always so much further that we could go with that. And so, and we have a quite an expansive product portfolio now, so it's a lot of work to bring it all up to modern sort of techniques and practices. 
Um, feature depth is all about going deeper on existing functionality that's in the products today. And then stability has been a constant focus as well. Um, for those of you who keep track of support.dnnsoftware.com, you know that anyone in the community can log an issue at any time when they find issues with our, our products. And so it's a constant focus for us to try to keep up with that backlog, prioritize, keep, make sure that the highest priority and the most severe items are dealt with in a responsive way as we can. DNN 7.3 specifically uh, is a release that we embarked upon December, I guess it was. And so typically for the last two or three years, we've had two major releases per year. Um, and then we've had maintenance releases in between. So again, for, for this year, we're planning on having two major releases. Um, the DNN 7.3 release is the one we're focused on right now. And as a general theme for this release, we focused on performance as being sort of the common thread across all of the different changes that we were going to make. And there was a lot of different areas we wanted to tackle that were part of performance. So the four major areas that we've identified here were around page output optimization, uh, server-side efficiency, improving the admin experience for people who are interacting with the software, and improving our support for web farms. So on the page output optimization side, we did come, out, or we did come up with a new default template. Um, We've gone through a number of different iterations with different default templates. Uh, the previous thinking was that when we came out with Awesome Cycles, the idea was that if we had sort of a fictitious company with a certain number of pages which represented maybe a typical type of website that a small business might want to have, that it was a good idea um, to include that with the platform because it gave people sort of a greater sense for what the software was capable of out of the box. Um, but there are some downsides to that in that it didn't have any direct ties back to the DNN community. Uh, and so what we've done now is we've gone back to a very simple page template, single page, one home page, with a lot of content on that home page which leads people back to the forums, leads them back to the blogs, leads them back to all these areas of engagement where they can get additional help and assistance. That was not possible through the previous Awesome Cycles template. Uh, and so we think that we lost some connectivity and some level of engagement uh, as a result of that. And so that's what we are trying to address with the new template. Uh, in addition, obviously, we wanted to exemplify some more modern techniques such as responsive web design and also um, try to reduce um, the, the size of the overall pages as well. So, so sometimes people will evaluate a CMS by just spinning up the default implementation and looking at sort of the size of the pages and how much HTML markup is in the pages. Uh, and so we wanted to try and optimize that. Um, view state was, has long been an item on our list that we wanted to try and tackle in terms of reducing the amount of view state. And so this is the first time that we actually looked at it in a comprehensive way and looked at all of the different controls which were spitting out view state into the page and actually looking at whether or not that was required. Uh, we're pretty happy that we were able to, on a, for a tip for a standard page, to reduce the amount of view state from 4,000 bytes, which was DNN 722, down to 90 bytes. So that's a pretty substantial <laughs> reduction. And that, that benefits every single page view. Uh, on a website. Um, so that's a pretty good improvement. For server-side efficiency, um, we were pretty lucky that uh, the folks from 51 Degrees, and James is in the front here, um, were rolling out a new version of their uh, device detection algorithm and uh, database uh, at the same time that we are wanting to do performance optimizations for the platform itself. And so they came up with a pretty substantial improvement uh, in terms of performance of their component. And so that provides some benefits for us. In addition, they changed the way it works so that it no longer, well, you have the option to use in memory, but it, it by default doesn't use in memory. So it just has an algorithm which reads disk instead, and it's very efficient. Um, previous versions of DNN would have to load the entire 51 degrees database into memory uh, so that it could do fast lookups, but that's no longer the case. So again, that's redu reducing resource consumption on the server, uh, which is very much in line with our server efficiency goals. Um, database access and caching was looked at and in terms of you know, trying to reduce the number of database calls that happen uh, on a typical uh, page view or typical request doing more granular management of objects. So instead of expiring a cache or an entire collection of objects, maybe ex instead of expiring a single object, if that was all that was changed, which um, reduces the amount of information that needs to be exchanged between the server uh, and the client. 
Um, schedule improvements. So the scheduler has long been a feature in the, in the platform that everyone relies upon for doing background um, jobs and tasks. Um, but we felt that that area needed some improvements so that you had a little bit more control over the scheduling of these tasks. So we added the ability so that you can have a start time so that you can choose to maybe run tasks in the middle of the night if you so desire. So you can choose a start date and a start time, um, which just provides you a lot more control. Also better control for multiple servers. So in a web farm, it was kind of difficult to understand what was going on with the scheduler at times. So we improved the user interface. And also um, in in adding a delay for initialization. So you can wait for basically your site to warm up and get to a steady state before the scheduled jobs start to run. Um, and this, start, this prevents some of the thrashing that would sometimes happen when a whole bunch of scheduled jobs would all start at the same time um, when the site was restarting. On the admin side, um, in general what we are trying to deal with is websites that have a lot of data, a lot of pages, a lot of folders, a lot of users. Um, previous versions of our user interface didn't scale very well once you got to having a lot of information that you were managing in your site. They worked fine on a default install where you had five pages and one user, um, but as that scaled up, obviously, you would sometimes run into, de into issues, and we were having some of these problems ourselves on dnnsoftware.com. So um, we picked a few scenarios, um, and we actually, this is sort of completing some work that we began last year. So we picked some of the different user experience scenarios that would typically be run into when you're administrating a site. So anytime you have to pick a page from a list, pick a user from a list of users, pick a folder or a file, what the system was doing before was often loading the entire collection uh, of those entities and shoving them into the user interface, which was producing major bloat uh, when you sent that down to the client. Um, so what we're doing now is being much more efficient about that, doing a lot of lazy loading, sending down just sort of the minimal amount of information initially, and then using AJAX techniques to pull back additional information as necessary. And that produces a lot better user experience um, when you have sites with a lot of data. Uh, the control bar, uh, one of the major problems with the control bar that we introduced in DNN 7 was when you went to add a, a new module to a page. If you had a whole lot of modules that were installed on your site, um, that would be all pushed down to the page, and that produced a lot of extra overhead uh, on the client side uh, and made it kind of cumbersome to deal with. And so that was an area we wanted to focus on. And the last one was permissions grids. So ever since the beginning of time with DNN and the permissions grids, we would show basically almost all of the roles that you had configured in your site and a big grid. And often the majority of those roles weren't even applicable to that specific scenario. And so what we've done now is we're only loading um, certain global roles and then a list of the roles that are actually assigned permissions to that page. So basically condensing the amount of information that's sent down to the browser. So all of these scenarios were intended to make the administration experience more efficient. One of the other side benefits of this is that these controls that we created, so the file picker control, user picker, page picker, are all controls that were developed in such a way that you can actually utilize them within your own custom modules that you're building too. So you can leverage some of these controls that we've created which, which use AJAX and are much more efficient within your own custom modules. So then you get the same user experience in your custom modules as what we're using in the core and get the improved performance benefit. Um, the last area in terms of themes for performance was around web farms. And so the ability to support web farms today is something that we reserve for the Evoke uh, content, Evoke social products. Um, we added some new capabilities here. Um, the ability to have different configurations for supporting multiple environments. So if you have a staging environment and a production environment, you would often want to back up the database from production, move it into staging, test some new functionality, and then deploy that functionality back into production. Well, when you went to restore the database from production into staging, you would have to do a whole lot of extra configuration around servers, because the servers would all be different in staging, um, in order to get the site working properly. And if you forgot to do that, it would have some pretty bad ramifications sometimes, because um, jobs wouldn't run when they were supposed to run. So it wouldn't be basically 
and and it wouldn't be a mirror image of production immediately. You'd have to do a whole lot of configuration to make it work. So these um, these web server groups will allow you to have multiple configurations that you store within the same database, and when you restore from production to staging, everything should just work as expected. Also, the web server management interface, where you can manage the various servers that are part of your farm, um, has been improved substantially, uh, so that it focuses on the active servers rather than all of the servers, which sometimes that list can become quite long over time. Uh, and many of those servers that are in the list, you don't even you know, I mean, they're not even used anymore. Um, also, we had a dependency um, in our web request caching provider um, on portal aliases, which, was, which really shouldn't have been there to begin with, um, because the web request caching provider actually works at the site level. It doesn't work on a per portal basis. Uh, and so having to make people jump through additional hoops in terms of setting up a portal alias and then going into web server management and associating that to a web server there was multiple steps that were non-intuitive and non-discoverable, so we wanted to get rid of that and make it much easier to set up a web farm. And lastly, in environments where there's hot swap scenarios where a new server is added to a farm or a server is removed from a farm, and this is pretty common in the new cloud environment such as Azure, where at any point in time a new server can be spun up and a, another server can be taken down. Um, we needed the ability for the software to be aware of that and adjust immediately and accordingly. So some of the ways that we're doing that are we're basically internally keeping track of the health of the various servers that are in the farm. If one of those servers is removed, if there were scheduled jobs that were meant exclusively to run on that server and it's no longer there, they will automatically fail over to another server that's in the farm. So your site won't get unhealthy. Um, and, and there'll obviously be notifications also sent out around those moves as well, but if you're not aware of those changes when they happen immediately, your site should still remain healthy. Um, lastly, there were some things that were not specifically related to performance, but were so related to um, things that we wanted to, to tackle with the platform in 7.3. So uh, one of the things that's been in the platform for a long time is this notion of the portal root folder. Um, the portal root folder today, or up until 722, has always had to be a local folder in the website itself. Uh, and so a lot of people would store content files in that root folder, and that creates problems when you want to utilize sort of cloud environments more effectively. And so it would be much better if you could actually store all of your content files in some other location and only store your application files within the site itself. And so having the ability to configure that portal route um, is pretty important, and we finally decided that we were going to tackle this. Um, and it also, so one of the reasons that we wanted to do this as well is in our Azure environment, so our cloud environment, um, we wanted to be able to take advantage of this and store all of our content by default in Azure storage and having the, the DNN platform bits um, stored in the, uh, the worker role, or the web role, sorry. And then um, on the API housekeeping side, um, we sort of were overdue for some housekeeping of our, of our API controllers. Um, for a long time, we've wanted to have all of our core uh, controllers testable um, for unit testing. And that wasn't really possible um, because of we were using a lot of shared methods. And we also had dependency on HTTP context. So we actually went through and did a lot of cleanup, removed the dependency on HTTP context. Um, made all of the main controllers, so portal controller, tab controller, module controller, user controller, all of them testable. Um, and so you can actually write unit tests against the core framework now, um, which was not previously possible. We also cleaned up the API because what we had done in the past when we were trying to go down a path towards making things testable is we created some testable controllers and we stuck some methods in those testable controllers which weren't available in the regular controllers created a bit of a mess from a developer's perspective in terms of trying to figure out where the different methods were in our core API that you would need as a third-party developer. Um, and so we moved all of those into the proper location so that they should be more intuitive and discoverable. Um, one primary one was role controller. So role controller had role controller and testable role controller and completely different methods in each one. Um, and it wasn't very intuitive, so we cleaned that up. 
Um, and so I wanted to actually show some of this in action. So I have a very small screen here now. So we shall warm up. This is a, so it, I think everyone here knows that um, as of last year, we started providing nightly builds. Um, so from our development branch that we're working on for DNN 7.3, there is a page on our website that you can go to within the platform section for nightly builds, and you can get the latest version of the code from there at any time to install. Um, so you can see exactly where we are um, in, in terms of progress. Uh, and this is, we were hoping that there would be more engagement in the nightly builds in terms of people downloading them, testing, and if they found issues early in some of these you know, development builds, that they would submit those as issues so that we could actually leverage the community more for testing so that we would increase the stability. I don't know if that's really happened yet, and so that's why I'm sort of mentioning the nightly builds, uh, because all of you do have access to that. Uh, so the new template, as I mentioned, um, is a lot, it's a single page now, it's just a home page, uh, and it is focused on all of the different areas of engagement. Um, so it sort of immediately tells people where to go to get, you know, to ask questions, where to find blogs, find the, the top um, contributors within the community on the leaderboard, find videos, find additional commercial modules, get help, go to the forum. So all of these links that are in this template now weren't there before. And these all sort of drive people back to get involved with the community uh, and get answers to their questions more easily. Um, and so one thing that I did is um, to do, try, to, try to do an apples to apples comparison between DNN 7.3 and 7.2.2. Um, what I did is I, I installed both of those products and I used the blank template um, to create a portal in each one of them. So, because I wanted to use the same exact template to compare the output between the two of them. And so I did that and then I captured the, the actual output of the page so that I could compare the sizes. And so here's an example of two different um, scenarios. So this, this first lower one is the number of bytes um, for a visitor visiting a site going to that home page, so not logged in. So 722 had 16.6 .6 kilobytes and 73 is 12.1. So it's about a 25% benefit and for, for a non uh, logged in user. And then for a host user, when you're logged in and you have the full control panel and all of the admin experience, it was reduced from 57.5 to 43.5. Um, so that's a pretty substantial um, benefit in terms of the amount of um, markup that's being sent down to the browser, um, which allows you to serve up more pages. Um, where did we get the benefit, or, or where did we reduce the effort? So I have beyond compare here. And so for a visitor, this is the actual page output that, that spit out from the home page. And we can see that um, we got rid of some white space. That's probably not a very substantial change. But the big change is in the view state area. So um, here's the view state here for 722 and the view state for 73. So as I scroll over, you'll see that 73 is like a very small piece of view state. I don't know if you can really see that very well. But 722, I'll keep scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. <laughs> Lots of view state there. Um, so that's the majority of the, the change um, between 7.2.2 and 7.3 that produced the benefit. Uh, if I look at the host experience, again, the amount of view state is even more substantial in this scenario. So on 7.2.2 side, I mean, this is, there's a massive amount of view state that's, that's generated. Um, but the other thing we identified was that we, for the control panel, we were sending down a whole lot of uh, HTML markup related to the control panel, which didn't need to be there because it was only necessary in specific scenarios. Um, and so by default now, it's actually doing this dynamically and pulling this down as needed. Uh, and so that produced some of the benefits there. So really looking at the page output, looking to see what was absolutely required to send down to the page in these different scenarios, and then tailoring the, the, the platform to do a much better job at that. Um, so with that, if I uh, log into this instance of 7.3, so some of the, um, the improvements in the user interface that I wanted you to see, 
around the control panel. So if I go into modules and I say add new module, um, we'll see that it still loads in from the side, um, but it, what it's doing is it's only loading the list of modules that are visible in the viewport now. And then as I scroll, it's going to actually see there's, it, there's Ajax and it loads additional modules. So it doesn't load down, it doesn't pull down the entire list of modules by default. Uh, we also added some additional capabilities, so you have, you know, the ability to filter still. But you can also search, so if I wanted to search for the banners module, um, it, it, you can actually search for specific modules that are across the entire installation, uh, and it'll bring back those that match. So just additional ways that you can manage the, can, the, the, ma the modules that are on your site. Um, if I go into the edit page scenario, we'll be able to see an example of how the uh, user interface has changed. On dnnsoftware.com, because we have so much content on that site, when I would go into page settings, I would sometimes have to wait 60 seconds for the page to load because of the amount of information that was being sent down to the browser. Um, so one area that we've changed is we have a new um, file picker, um, which is only pulling down a minimal amount of information and also has some additional capabilities here where you can do drag and drop to upload files. But by default, I mean, it's dynamically pulling the list of folders um, as you as you choose, because not every time would you be choosing um, to actually change the, uh, the file or folder. So you shouldn't be pulling down the entire list of folders that are available for this site. Um, and then on the permissions side, the permissions grid is substantially reduced in size. Um, so all of this produces less output being sent down to the page. On the device detection side, so if I go into the host area, this is a uh, the platform edition. Um, so I, there's not really much I can show you here other than the fact that uh, this is running the 51 degrees V3. And one of the things that um, we're quite happy about is that uh, 51 degrees made some specific enhancements that, based on our uh, requests. One was if your site isn't using device detection at all, you now have an easy way to disable it. Um, and there is obviously some performance benefit that you get by disabling it um, because that is additional processing that is happening on every page request. Um, but if you do enable it, uh, I mean, now the 51 degrees algorithm is 100 times faster than it used to be, so even with it enabled, it, it still is substantially better than it was before, which provides a better user experience for DNN as a result. Um, what they also added is the ability to control whether or not auto updates are downloaded automatically from their servers. So if you're in an environment where they don't, really don't want to see much outbound traffic going to servers uh, outside the website, you can disable that now and you can actually use a manual method for updating your, your 51 degrees data if you so desire. Um, and then I don't want to spend too much longer on demo, but the last area I wanted to show is in the scheduler area. Um, so we now have the ability to filter um, the schedule by server. So if you're using multiple servers and you're distributing the load of the scheduled jobs across many servers, you can easily just pick a single server from the list and it'll load those jobs that are specifically intended to run on that server. The section that's down here on the bottom in the settings, so this used to be buried somewhere within the host settings, so we actually moved it to where it probably belonged in the first place. So the mode, um, timer mode versus request mode is still supported, but I mean, it's easy to tell now which mode you're running. And this delay schedule at startup is a new feature, which was what I was describing earlier, where you can delay the execution of scheduled jobs for a period of time after a site restart. So by default, it's set to one minute. So after a minute, it assumes the site is fully up and running and r running properly, and then it can start executing jobs. And this prevents some like locking issues and things that we were having previously. I think that's all I want to cover where it comes to, uh, to demo. Um, if you want to see more of what's going on with 7.3, like I said, you can download the latest from our nightly build page. You just can't download it from here. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Yeah, unfortunately. So what we'll do is we'll go through a little bit more, go through the social and, and uh, content solutions. Then we're going to go into uh, where we see things headed from a technology standpoint and how that relates to DNN. We'll try to allow a little bit of time for questions, but then I think what uh, 
Uh, Claudio has asked that we have time for a coffee break, and then during the roundtable, you might have lots of questions, and we can take them then. So just to, to reiterate some things here around the solutions, we don't have enough time to go into all the details with features and stuff, but what's important to understand is that we are working to, instead of trying to create a whole breadth array of, of features, we're trying to go more into depth. And that depth is focused around different personas, different target customer audiences, not just on the product side, but the specific personas for that individual solution itself. And that is causing a lot of the features that we drive in the platform as well. So we take what the community has, we take what we need for the solutions, those go into the platform as well so that we enhance this for the benefit of everybody. And in the context of the content um, product of Evoke Content, it's really focusing more on the content manager, not just somebody who's managing a website. With Evoke Social, we're doing something similar. We just recently announced or released uh, Social 2.0, and this is focused around the community manager. So if you think about it, you have all these people now that are able to use a social networking product that is based on Evoke content, uh, excuse me, Evoke social, but how do you really drive engagement? How do you get people to interact with your site the way you want, helping one another, uh, helping to drive revenue to your company? Well, that is one role of the community manager. And so what we did was we spent a lot of upfront time working on designs and improvements from a user perspective that were then implemented in the product. And unfortunately, we can't really demonstrate it today because we don't have the, the connection. We didn't put it locally. If we did, then you'd see what we mean. And you'd also understand a little bit more about how we're doing things from a client side standpoint. Going forward, we're going to take this so that we enable the, uh, the users of the social product to focus much more on tying social capabilities, social engagement to revenue. So making sure that people are not just interacting for the benefit of communicating, answering questions about how to support something, but helping to support one another towards a buying decision, which leads to revenue for the companies that have deployed the product. And that, we believe, then falls in with the earlier strategy that we showed where we're trying to tie the products to revenue generation as opposed to just cost savings. Again, this is all based on DNN, DNN that we're building today, that we're going to be building tomorrow, that we we'll continue to enhance. One of the things you notice is that we're trying to also take a little bit more of a cloud-first approach because it's easier to develop for the cloud and then make it available on-premise than it is to go the other direction. And we have a lot of customers, particularly for these solutions, that want to work with a cloud deployment. We've also, as I mentioned, going into much greater focus around customer personas. And I really can't say that enough in terms of the importance. We spend a lot of time doing what we call design sprints. They're really uh, upfront design analysis where we have a UI UX designer, we have a product manager, a developer, and we have some outside designer assistants working together in very concentrated ways, not just coding, but working with yellow stickies and whiteboards to really look at things from the user's standpoint. Everything from what it takes to get them to onboard in a quickly and effectively in the product to what happens when, when they sit in front of the product hour after hour on any given day. And then we take that and we feed that into uh, product requirements that then are worked by the product team, both product management and engineering together, to deliver the solution. And once we have that level of definition and we have an extreme amount of detail in the form of mock-ups, then the teams work actually very quickly to, pollute, to produce the solutions. Well, we're going to continue to do that, and we're also going to make it possible to integrate more, not just with the DNN platform, but with other platforms that are out there. And when I say platform, not just referring to content management systems, but there are other types of, of services that are available, things like Salesforce.com, et cetera, 
where people get value, and if we can hook into those, then we overall do better for the customers we're trying to serve. So this is a real important thing for us. Since I mentioned cloud, the last year we talked in depth about the cloud architecture. I had David Rodriguez here, and we went in great detail about what we're doing. There's not enough time to go through that today. That would be a session in and of itself. But what I want to highlight is a, an evolution of our focus that is really around a managed service. We're not intending to be a hoster. We're not intending to put something out there and letting people do whatever they want in the virtual machine. We're doing the converse. We're putting out a solution that is very well targeted, and we want to take away capabilities from the user. We don't want them focusing on backups. We don't want them understanding what RDP is or FTP is. We want to do everything through the solution itself. And so we've been really simplifying this so that it's as straightforward as possible. We'll take care of the infrastructure. We'll take care of the backups. The user just needs to worry about the content. In the case of Evoke Content, or in the case of Evoke Social, they worry about their community and engagement. They worry about the analytics and looking at the verification, confirmation of people being engaged. These are the sort of things that they do best while we handle the infrastructure itself. So why don't we uh, start going a little bit more forward-looking. People have been asking about roadmaps and things. They're not here today to say, here's each and every feature for the next release. That's not what we want to do. But we want to give you a little bit of insight as to where we're headed and some of the challenges we have around creating that next uh, stage for DNN. Okay. Yeah, so and what Bob's referring to mostly is on the technology side, we've been thinking a lot about the technology of the DNN platform and how we can move forward from where we are today and continue to be relevant, modern, and provide something that all of you will be able to benefit from and rely upon for many years to come. Um, so one of the things that helps us in terms of our direction is that, I mean, we have commercial interests. Um, that we offer commercial solutions on top of the platform. So that obviously ties us to the platform and makes us want to create something that has some longevity to it. And we want to increase community submissions. So again, contributions um, that we talked about earlier through pull requests. We want to focus on client side capabilities. We've been doing this steadily more and more pushing more and more to the client because the browser is a lot more capable than it used to be. We should be leveraging the most that we can of that browser experience. Um, paying more attention and better attention constantly to performance. And so we did just did some great work to improve the performance of 7.3. How do we ensure that we don't go backwards from where we are? You know, how do we ensure that we always maintain at least that level or even get better? Um, so building those types of practices into our our engineering organization to ensure that we, we constantly focus on performance. And then also looking at modernization. Um, the web and, and web development in general has changed dramatically in recent years and many people would look at DNN and see that there's some legacy aspects to it. Um, a lot of you are doing some fairly cutting edge things on DNN as well because there is a lot of flexibility to it. And so we're looking at you know how can we exemplify more of those more cutting edge scenarios as we go forward. Um, so we want to continue, we've always done a good job at providing a, not just one developer experience, but supporting many different developer experiences. For example, if you're still comfortable doing strictly visual basic and web forms, you should still be able to do that with DNN and you can today. But if you're on the forefront and you want to be doing HTML5, CSS, JavaScript, Razor, you should be able to do that as well and not even think much about web forms or, or, or things like that. And so um, we've been thinking a lot about that. Um, Microsoft in general has taken a lot of focus off of web forms over recent years and has put more focus into MBC. I mean, MBC is up to, I think, version 5 now, right? Four or five? Anyways, I mean, it's, it's evolved. It's become very mature. Uh, and very recently at, at TechEd, Microsoft um, announced the next generation of their web platform. Still obviously called .NET, but I mean, it's very different in, in its characteristics. Much more lightweight, much more, 
very different in, in its capabilities, but still exemplifying certain techniques like MVC going forward. And so um, they've codenamed that project K. And so we're looking at, so how can we evolve DNN so that we can leverage more of their, those techniques going forward? Um, one of the things that we wanted to do is that we wanted to continue to leverage the existing platform um, because that reduces the risk um, for us as a company in terms of, because if we went out and tried to build something like DNN from scratch, that's super high risk. I mean, there is a, a decade worth of experience that's gone into DNN already. Uh, and I don't know how many of you, sort of, there's a lot of technology folks in the audience, I think, and you always think hypothetically that you could do a better job the second time, but you forget about all of the domain experience you learned along the way. Uh, and usually what you end up is taking two steps or three steps backwards before you can actually move forward again. And so we were trying, we, we want to focus on making the platform better. Um, we want to focus on, again, the multi-portal aspect. This has been sort of one of the key differentiators of DNN over time, the fact that you can host multiple sites with unique content, unique users, and unique apps all within the same environment, um, which is essentially multi-tenancy. Um, that's what they call it nowadays. When we started doing multi-portal, they didn't call it multi-tenancy then, but that's essentially what it is. And that's how most of the multi-tenant systems today are built. So, and a lot of folks, probably for some of you, are building multi-tenant solutions using DNN platform today, because it is a great platform for doing that. Um, and then want to utilize techniques um, as we build out that are part of our technology future. Do you want to tackle a slide on this? Yeah, I can do that. So, what was that? This one's got a lot of... <laughs> yeah, well, and actually everybody can read this stuff faster than I can just say it, but, you know, one of the things that I talked about when I was here last year was that we need to be more forward thinking. And part of the problem is that if I look at the ecosystem, if I even look within DNN Corp itself, We'd almost been too inbred. And it's one thing to focus on continuing to support the existing infrastructure. It uh, you know, continues to provide value. We want to make sure there's compatibility. But at the same time, it's almost like we're afraid to step out and try new things. And the fact is, the world is advancing. And there are new techniques, new frameworks that we should be using. You know, it's great that we're doing a lot more on the client side, that we're able to have that richer experience for people. But at the same time, on the back end, there's a bunch of things. We're getting people who are requesting MVC, not just because it's, a, you know, it's newer, but because from a pattern standpoint, there are improvements that can be leveraged. You can make things more testable along the way, for example. And so we need to be unafraid of trying those things and really looking at how they could be leveraged with the platform that we have today and how we can roll forward. It's, you know, in many respects, it's not unlike uh, some of the decision points that other companies, Microsoft being an example, but there are many others where they've got a successful platform today, they have an installed base, but they've got to step beyond that. You know, they, you can't carry everybody forward, you have to start looking at how we evolve and how we keep this being a very relevant foundation for new solutions. The new solutions that we build, new solutions that you build, and that customers are demanding. So this is all key to what we're, in essence, focusing on. Okay? Yeah, so this diagram tries to, from a high level, describe some of our, sort of our current architecture. So we've got, you know, uh, essentially URL routing, through the form of our, our advanced URL management. And through that routing capability, we identify um, which site within the installation um, that that request is directed at. Um, we have skins, which are based on a web forms model today. We have modules, which are based on a web forms model today. You can have multiple modules that exist on the page. Um, and under the covers, we're using um, web API um, we're using web services ourselves already today, utilizing web API um, to expose some aspects of our, our DNN API. We're still built on the .NET framework, and we use SQL Server. So high level, sort of as we look uh, forward, we still want to retain some of the characteristics that have been successful for DNN. Um, the ability to have a composite page 
framework, the ability to have multiple pieces of content on a single page that you manage independently from one another. Um, this is a key differentiator. This is not something that's even possible within sort of vanilla MVC from Microsoft today. Right? Typically MVC, it's sort of one type of application on a single page. Um, so, but this is always, this sort of portal-like capability has always been one of the differentiators of DNN, and we need to retain that um, because that's what sort of is part of our reputation, that's what people expect from DNN. Um, this loosely coupled model where you build modules that can be plugged in, um, and there's, they're, they are coupled and dependent upon the underlying platform, but there isn't a super tight coupling there, they're, they're fairly loosely coupled with some fairly simple interfaces. Um, we want to continue to support a model like that. DNN itself should be a, a fairly lightweight shell that allows you to surface applications and then it also provides some user interface capabilities and a permissions model, um, and which we already have a very rich, robust permissions model today, which we need to carry forward. Um, we need to provide simple third-party integrations, which we do today th through our module capability, um, but we also have other types of extensibility points, uh, and that should be a key uh, point that we carry forward as well. And then we need to support both on-premise deployments and SaaS-based or cloud-based deployments. And from a high level, and this is deemed to be research, but these are some of the things that we're looking at internally, um, is sort of how we could potentially evolve things. And so this doesn't mean that this is 100% moving to MVC, but really what we're looking at is can we support an MVC-like model in addition to the web forms model that we have today? Um, there are other CMS products on the market that are doing this today already. So we know it is possible to go down this path. Um, but this would allow those developers that are really care a lot about MVC to use a more MVC-like model for developing on DNN. Um, and for those people who are very comfortable using web forms, they continue to do web forms. Um, but by going at least down the web MVC path, it sets us up for the future and to be more aligned with where Microsoft is going as well. Because at some point in time, Microsoft is going to say, you know, web forms is, well, they're pretty much at that point now. They're pretty much saying web forms is not going to evolve any further. We're going to continue to maintain and support web forms ongoing, but there's no new development going on in web forms. All of the effort is being put into MVC and Project K and new technology. And so in order for us to ensure the life of DNN long term, we need to look at following that path as well. So I heard uh, some questions while um, during the course of the, the day about Joe Brinkman. Like, Where's Joe Brinkman? It's like, where's Waldo? Where's Joe Brinkman? Nobody seems to know what he's up to. Well, one of the things that I had him doing fairly recently was looking at some of these new services and some of these new capabilities. And so Sean was mentioning about having DNN be a lightweight um, compositing engine, being able to add things to it. Well, I asked Joe to build something which was totally outside of DNN. We had set up a service, it was purely a, uh, a web service, not built on the platform. Um, it was, uh, from our standpoint, it was a very focused solution, had a NoSQL database, and asked them to integrate it into DNN itself. And it was amazing, when we were done, it looked and felt just like a normal module would be within DNN, and from a user standpoint, you didn't see any difference. But what was missing was the use of a common permissioning system and all of this that really ties it together as an integrated whole. So we know it's possible to really follow through with the vision that we've laid out here. What we need to do is make sure that it's really tight. Make sure that we can leverage some of these newer technologies to our advantage and also do that in a really smart way. So if you ask me what sort of things I'd like to hear from the community, well, you know, it's this, it's, you know, what sort of things do you think of when we talk about moving beyond the existing infrastructure that we have today for DNN? It could be around MVC, it could be around NoSQL, it could be around web services, but those sorts of things would be very interesting. And if you talk about wanting to be engaged from a community standpoint, that's one of the things that could help an awful lot. So again, this is research. But I expect that fairly soon we'll start to um, solidify some of this. This is in addition, by the way, to discussions around workflow and other things that we all know um, are 
um, important and desired for the foundation that we have today. But again, from, uh, from a product team standpoint, we've got to be moving beyond just where we're at today. I mean, web forms has come to the end of its life. Microsoft's not enhancing that. They're going forward with other technologies. We feel that those technologies are vital. Um, it's not just because we're trying to follow Microsoft everywhere. It's because they make sense. They're useful. We can leverage them. So just to summarize some of the things that we went through today, you know, we covered um, quite a bit about the, the various products themselves. We spend a lot of time on platform because we know that's of greatest interest to everybody. It's important that you understand that we continue to maintain a strong balance between the community and commercial side of things. That doesn't mean that it's always a perfect balance. It changes from time to time. And there are a lot of things that the commercial side does drive into the community product. But we also are leveraging a lot of the input from the community, both in terms of comments and submitted code. We had quite a lot of pull requests. I guess there were close to 100 that came in. We had, I think, 98 that were accepted. There's um, several that were rejected for various reasons. But, you know, this sort of interaction is really healthy and is much greater than what we've had in recent years. And I'd like to see that be stronger still. So this is all extremely important to us. Um, there's certainly, from a uh, targeting standpoint, an extreme emphasis on the marketing organization and not just IT. And I think those of you who are on the front lines talking to customers, I think you have to agree that moving beyond the IT organization and their continually tight budgets and, and cost-saving measures, not the answer, compared to somebody who's got money to spend because they're looking to bring more revenue into their companies. And then finally, we talked about a technology strategy, and you know, we're very open with this. There's, this is kind of a, a tough thing at the moment because ideally we'd like to come up and say, here's what we're going to do, what do you think? You know, here are the time frames for it. We're not quite there yet. So we decided to be a bit bold and show you what sort of things we're working on. We have yet to cast everything in concrete, but your feedback is absolutely essential to us. So I hope you found today's session useful, and thank you very much for having us. Thank you.